Hello and welcome to the Marsha McAdam Data and Analytics Podcast, connecting talented people and always trying to find the cutting edge in data, technology and transformation. I'm your host, Joram Falkenberg, and today I'm joined by Chelsea Wise, Marketing Director of HyperAna, an AI and data flow automation platform, and Tian Dreyer, CEO of Nose, a disruptive pet insurance company. Today, we'll be talking about some of the biggest issues and problems businesses face with their data and analytics, which is getting value out of their data while dealing with financial and organizational obstacles. We'll get into that right after this. Welcome to the Marshall McAdam Data and Analytics Podcast, where Australian business leaders and experts discuss the data challenges facing organizations today and the opportunities for innovative business in the future. Let's get the conversation started. Yeah, so welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Dion, Chelsea. So Chelsea, you're also known as Dr. Wise, right? <laughs> with, a, with a PhD in marketing and statistics. Um, you're currently the marketing director at Hyperana, uh, headquartered in Sydney. Um, and yeah, it's one of the fastest growing startups in Australia and also in the data and analytics space. You're now currently the marketing director, right? Yes. But um, do I understand correctly that you are also one of the co-founders at the start? No, not one of the co-founders, but definitely a part of that early team in the first year. Right. Um, so I definitely know what it was like when we were in an office with less than 10 people um, and the pressure was the role that I came into to help Natalie was at the time she was the co-founder, the CEO, trying to think of further investment, She'd already secured, or the company had already secured a number of customers, and she was still building product. Mm. So I remember talking to her in the early days going, I'll help you only when you have customers, because then I know it's legit. Mm. There's some kind of product market fit. And I didn't believe that within the first year that they would have some customers to help. So my goal was to basically work on PowerPoint presentations and present to customers. Um, and that was the problem that I came in to solve, just to help with our customer base. Yeah, great, great. But you do actually have a, um, well, I guess some statistics, data science, yes. data background yourself. Yes, as well. yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Great, great. Well, let, well let's get into that uh, in a sec. But of course, you, Tian, as well. Um, you're born in South Africa. Yeah. You're a, a former CFO, um, former head of strategy, um, an entrepreneur at heart, having started your first business uh, at the age of 17. Yeah. Um, you're now CEO of Nose. Um, a fast-growing, disruptive pet insurance company. Um, yeah, taking Australia by storm. So, um, by the way, I have to ask, what um, what business did you start at the age of 17? A couple. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first one was just uh, printing T-shirts and uh, finding people that wanted T-shirts for different events, finding somebody that could supply it and being a, a, a market maker there and just, you know, uh, get that out. And then... Uh, as well, just shortly after that, um, South Africa went for a change, changed up provinces, went from four to nine, and during that process, uh, everyone had to get new number plates. Mm. So bought uh, with with a family and, and a friend a number um, plate print uh, machine and uh, set up a little Wendy house outside the municipality building, and when people came out with their paper slip, having to now get their new number plate, we were right there to help them windy plates and, and, and made them some number plates. Now, that was obviously very short-lived, um, but I think part of being an entrepreneur is, is uh, seizing the opportunity, uh, regardless of whether it's something that's that's sustainable in the long term or something that just makes sense for a short period of time. All right, right. Oh, exciting stuff. So, and now you're CEO of Nose, right? The yeah. insurance company. Can you yeah, tell us a bit about what is Nose and what, I suppose, makes it different to, you know, other pet insurance companies? Yeah. So um, founded Nose three and a half years ago. So uh, I've been in pet insurance now for the last eight years or so. And um, what we saw over the time, uh, Nathan, my co-founder and I, was that more and more people take up pet insurance. But one of the challenges is that people still don't do the preventative stuff that should be your first line of defense. And uh, sometimes it's just people forget or things are hard to source. Uh, and so we started a product that um, works with veterinary practices to help them to offer subscriptions to their customers. And then these subscriptions 
give you access to the vet preventative services at the vet, but also send you the, the parasite control, very important in Australia, uh, send you that whenever it's due. And then um, about 18 months ago, we, we launched the pet insurance so that you've got now a comprehensive solution for your pet. There's a, a preventative subscription and then there's a uh, insurance that covers you for the unexpected for when things go wrong. Right, right. So obviously you're a business owner with certain challenges in data and analytics. And, you know, let's get into that in a second. But maybe, um, maybe Chelsea, you can also explain what is Hyperana and what do you do? Um, so Hyperana is an AI powered data analyst. Um, that sounds really buzzwordy and hypey. But the problem that we're trying to solve is making data and insights accessible for everyone. And again, that might sound like a big mission statement. But the fact is, if I put on my old statistics hat on, I used to, I was a lecturer at the University of Technology in academic for 10 years, teaching business statistics. And even in the classroom with highly skilled university eager students, it was the one course that everyone either avoided or their standards were, I just need to pass this. Mm. Stats, numbers, analytics, I'm not a maths person. These would be the things that I would hear all the time, as opposed to all of my business students that really wanted to excel and do really, really well. Mm. So when I left academia and went into the big world of consulting, um, I did huge projects for one of Australia's largest retailers, Woolworths. And again, you know, it was part of my remit for the consultancy Quantium was to help embed customer analytics to the commercial teams. But these people are butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. So they know their customers, they know the importance of customer data, but making it simple, accessible, um, especially to people, like if you think of head of produce, head of bakery, they're up, they're at the fresh markets at 3, 4, 5 a.m. Um, even if I run a training session on customer data and give them a tool to analyze information at 10 a.m., they're like, they're gone. Their day is like, and the way in which they would be analyzing that data, we're talking pivot tables. We're talking spreadsheets. Um, again, if you put on my like insurance hat where you think of actuaries or if you think of statisticians, they love to drown in spreadsheets. But within most organizations, big or small, spreadsheets, reports, dashboards, it's, they're everywhere. But whether they actually give you insights and tell you simple answers to questions like, who are my customers? If I cross this by the vets in Australia, um, by different channels, by, di um, di by different marketing channels, by different states, by different types of companies, getting the insights takes, dare I say it, a shitload of time, <laughs> a long time. So I might have a question on Monday. If the dashboard or the report that I receive monthly doesn't give me those answers. If I'm privileged to have an analyst, I'll brief that analyst maybe an hour later. The analyst on Tuesday might start that report, build some data, put some, put some analysis together. The earliest I can get the answers is Wednesday. And that's only if I've got, again, analyst opportunity and the data is already accessible Typically, when you get insights, they never answer the first question. It triggers then the next question yep. because only when you've got a question, then it's like, well, that wasn't the right question. Now I want to see nuances. So what we're trying to automate, AI Hyperana being this AI-powered analyst, is really just automating proactive analysis. There's no predictive thing. She's not doing anything magical there, but she's surfacing the insights that already exist within your data without you having to ask the question or for even the analytical minded to know, to help you know what was the right question to ask at the beginning and right. to just accelerate that process. So you get answers within a few minutes, not wait days. Right, right, sound familiar? Uh, absolutely, so it was actually <laughs> when, when uh, Charles was explaining, uh, thought back to an old cult classic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it, it, it's like that, right? So what's the question, the answer to everything? And eons pass, the experiment on Earth, the answer's 42. It's like, oh, I probably didn't state that question right. And it's obviously that's hyperbole, but that's yeah. pretty much what it's like if you're a manager and you want questions, you, you ask the question, the answer comes back. You're lucky if you get, get it next day, right? And because usually it's, yeah. it, in my experience, you know, you get it next week and then you realize, okay, there's a follow-up question and then you know it's going to be another week. Uh, and, and that's a big challenge. Yeah. Right. And the problem like is compounded. So 
like it costs a lot of money to hire data analysts, data scientists. Um, many organizations, young organizations that are starting that want to be digital first, data driven first, they don't have the opportunity to hire analysts. And then you think of the flip side of the large organizations that do have the teams and the tools, they've got too many tools. So what do they do with too many tools and too many analysts? They stick to the status quo. They stick to the current ways in which they do things, which means at a very high level boards, you'll have maybe 10 people just working on one board pack for that meeting. That's a lot of time and a lot of money to only look backwards. Right. Um, so yeah, difficult problem for many organizations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so Tian, as a CEO, right, as a, as a business owner, um, what I suppose... Um, is or was, you know, the the big challenge, right, in terms of data analytics insights that you had or, or still currently have? Uh, I absolutely have them. It, it depends. It, it's very um, specific to the situation. And mm -hmm. if you're in a big organization, you know, it's it's the typical thing. It's a big ship. There's a lot of things to, and it's difficult to change. And you're stuck in legacy uh, technologies. Uh, and then when you're a nimble startup, you're nimble because you've got the small wooden boat with one oar. And yes, you can turn quickly, but you can't go fast anyway. Uh, and uh, so, you know, different scenarios, but the problem in the end is the same, is that you need information to make decisions and you just don't get the data to answer those questions because you don't have the wherewithal. Right, right. And I think... I mean, actually, what, what spawned this whole episode was a conversation that you had with my colleague, Tim, mm. around, you know, your challenges, you know, in data and analytics. Um, I suppose, you know, maybe you can kind of recap that conversation. Mm. And yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I think one of the things that's um, beneficial to being a startup today, as opposed to, say, even 10 years ago, is that so much of what you need to run a company, you don't have to go build. You can just plug into third party services and... Uh, in many ways, you're ahead of your larger competitors that are stuck in in technology that they, you know, had to build themselves. It's all bespoke and, you know, hangs together with, with sticky tape uh, where you can just plug into some of these third-party services. Um, and so at Nose, we've, we've done that, right? So we, we don't own, for instance, uh, the, the core policy management system, but we were able to plug into a third party that just does that. It's new tech. And we're part of their journey as well. They're also a startup, but you know you can just plug in there, uh, and and different other things. For instance, when um, when we decided to become a fully remote organization when COVID hit, we were already half remote. There were just technologies we could just plug into to make that seamless. Uh, however, when it comes to to data and data analytics, the only thing you can plug into is Excel in your own time, uh, and that's what I mentioned to Tim that there is this organization, you know. In, in a previous uh, opportunity, work with with the founder, uh, and they trying to, or they are creating this this service where somebody can just plug into. Uh, now we're not a customer of Hibana at the moment, but um, just the fact that that exists is is exciting. Um, but that's definitely something that you know I think there should be more of those kind of things available if we want to see startups in Australia accelerate. Right. Right. And so, so Chelsea, you you mentioned uh, you know Woolworth, you know huge organization, um, lots of resources, right? Um, I suppose would Hyperana be applicable for smaller organizations as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in the early days, we were focused on. I mean, you don't start a company with small ambitions, um, so. Natalie was like, okay, this has to work for a large enterprise. Um, it's not going to be a small cafe. It's not going to have data that they're going to want to run insights on every, every, every single day. So the feeling at the start was, okay, yes, large organizations, um, but as much as we can build this tool, this software that analyzes data and gives you really clean insights out, we don't own the data. We're not the data owners. So working with organizations that have relatively clean data and have a need to analyze that and feel the pain of the spreadsheets of the pivot tables or feel the pain that the, the time, the speed to insights is too long, um, that was definitely our sweet spot and right. still is. Um, in the early days, we did focus on financial services only because, and people were like, oh, so you only like the banks and the insurance companies. And it was actually, no, we, it was more of a proof of concept for us. We're like, they're a proxy for having invested in 
pretty good data systems, data architecture, um, investing and understand the power of working with startups. So that ticked all the boxes. But we were very smart, well, smart, I shouldn't toot our own horn, but we were quite strategic in thinking, well, we're not going to just embed ourselves and do a proof of concept with a bank just on banking or financial data. We wanted to do something in marketing, in channel performance. We wanted to do something in uh, compliance. So it was always use case agnostic. Mm. And then after about two years of proof of concepts and working with the early customers, it was then how can we branch into other organizations or other industries? Um, so sound, now some of our most successful use cases are definitely outside of financial services. Right, right. And you mentioned compliance, um, insights, right? Is there any type of, I suppose, data um, or in type of insight that you do or don't do? Uh, Oh, so in terms of what we don't do, so we look at structured longitudinal um, panel data. So it's all technical of saying we, you, there needs to be a data set so that looks at something over time. So whether it's spend behavior, expense behavior, so think in procurement, they're constantly looking at expenses um, by supplier, by person, by product, um, by account rep, by line item, blah, 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 blah. So we're tracking things over time. So expenses, customers, um, you might be looking at campaigns over time. So think of something over time, that's what hyper, that's hyper and a sweet spot. We don't do text analysis, for instance. We're not predicting um, nuanced behavior and predicting outcomes and giving what if scenarios where it's really a function of sure the data in the past, but very specific contextual factors too that need to be I think that's the art and the science. That's where you have specialists that would build those models. Yeah, interesting. And maybe I'm curious, right? So as a, as a business owner, right, what type of insights are actually, uh, you know, most valuable to you? Um, <laughs> that also is very contextual. It depends on what the, the, the problem with the stage of the business. Uh, as a company that plays on the insurance space, ultimately it does come down to, to claim starter and, uh, a lot of insurance is ensuring that you have the right price for the right policy and then also that you structure your, your product correctly based on what the need is in the market. So uh, longitudinal data works there because uh, even things change. You're not trying to predict the next interaction. You're un un trying to understand cohorts. Um, but yes, I, I think so. That is interesting uh, and certainly that's the kind of thing that you can do on, on spreadsheets if you've got enough time, but things move fast. Uh, but then also marketing. Uh, I think the, the other thing with, with insurance is not only have you got to be able to understand risk profiles and build appropriate products, uh, but more and more it's about uh, ensuring that you've got the right distribution channels and market effectively. And uh, it's not just a marketing thing anymore. Uh, even the regulator now wants you to, to understand who you're building this product for and who you're marketing to. Uh, so it, it is really a circumspect thing, this, this whole marketing angle on insurance. And, and um, you know, I think those two things are probably the most important elements. Right, right. I mean, I can almost imagine at some point there are being, you know, potentially, uh, whether it's for you or any, any other business in the space, um, a question of, Ethics, right? Um, to what degree can you, you know, deny or accept a client based on the data, you know, that you're able to gather from them? Um, is there anything you are at this stage uh, looking at? Or um I suppose we're quite lucky in pet insurance and in that it, it's sort of clear cut. We think that pet insurance works for most pet owners that have a pet as a companion animal and clearly doesn't work for somebody that doesn't have a pet. Uh, I think it's it's um, something that's more relevant maybe in the credit space where people have an appetite for a product, but it's not right for them because it's not good for them. Uh, I, I don't think pet insurance quite falls into into that um, you know set of problems, but uh, that's just what I know about today. Right. right. And I think that's the other thing with, with data is you, you tend to ask questions based on the, the things that you're thinking about. And certainly as a, as a, uh, a startup, we're always wondering what is it wh that we don't know that we should be thinking about and not only asking questions of the data, but can the data tell me something that I'm not asking for? Uh, and currently that's not something that we have the wherewithal to, to do or, or, you know, enable the data to do. 
Right. Right. And is that something that you hear um, more often? Uh, definitely, definitely. To, to the point that one part, one of our core USPs within the product, Hyperano, is anomaly and outlier detection. Helping with that problem of... I, one problem as an analyst you get is just find me something interesting. Find me a golden nugget. Um, and then even if you stumble upon that, if you know how to find that golden nugget, you don't know whether that's one of many. So Anna proactively surfaces large changes, discrepancies, anomalies that detect that can be detected within the data set that you have. At least that's surfacing and making it transparent to that customer, to that team, to know, okay, this is actual customer behavior or actual product behavior. What you do with it now, how you act upon that, is that just a is it a COVID thing? Is it an like is there meaning behind this? Um, that's for them to decide. But in terms of software, we can automate surfacing those insights. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and so, um, you know, right, because these days we, we, we often hear, you know, hear the term AI, right, or uh, predictive analytics, right? It's, it's what you read when you open up a CEO magazine and, uh, you know, everyone, you know, is claiming to do it. Uh, everybody wants to do it. You know, most, most businesses see the value in it as well. Um, but, you know, the truth is they are nowhere near, you know, truly predictive analytic capabilities. Um, yeah, what is your take, Chelsea, for example, on that, on that disconnect? If I wear my non-marketing hat, it's all hype. <laughs> There's a lot of hype. Um, if I think back to when I was an academic, I, did a, I dabbled a lot in um, a little bit of neuroscience. So I would partner up with colleagues that were specialists in that area. I was a marketing practitioner slash scholar. Um, and I really knew how to understand eye tracking data and to run experiments, what people were looking at. And we were trying to co collaborate, uh, I'm sorry, connect what people were looking at, what people were thinking about. And if we put a picture, a PowerPoint slide of a people, of someone's brain, nine times out of 10, people would love to come to the presentation because they think we're mind reading. And legit, this was like 10 years ago, all at that time we could do was try and get the timestamps between the different methodologies, the eye tracking data, the neuro brain data that we were looking at and what people were actually choosing, like mouse clicking data together, like on the right time scale. So the yeah. method, and as scholars, we were very clear on that. If you were Time Magazine interviewing me, the first question would be, so I can see that you're reading brains. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of hyperana, like that's just a, a bit of a, a digression, but um, we're very clear on we automate the pain of spreadsheet reporting and dashboard reporting. We speed up that process. Um, we tell you about the past and we're surfacing all of those insights. Um, there is nothing forward looking about that. Um, in the future, whether that becomes a part of our, our product, who knows? Um, in the very early days when we would have conversations with, uh, even even now if we have conversations with data teams, they want to 100% know what does your product do, what does your product don't do. And I feel like we, we work really well when we're very clear on mm. this is legit what we do. So you can call it AI, you can call it whatever you want. You might not like that it's not predictive, but from a, I don't care if you're an individual that just has this curiosity, if we're solving an organizational problem, a business problem, where do we fit in? What does this replace? What does this speed up? What does this enable you to do? Um, and then how does that boil down into either saving money um, or making a little bit more money? Um, so yeah, to answer your question, AI, if I put my marketing hat back on, I love it because it definitely gets more clicks. People are interested in it. But once beyond that curiosity, that's not going to help you embed any product um, if you just rely on the buzzwords of AI. Mm. Um, so to me, I think more automation, but again, automation can be a dirty word, but I don't want to go down that rabbit <laughs> hole unless you want us to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, how, how far along would you say, you know, noses with regards to predictive analytics? Not, not very far, and that's a quite simple answer. I think you need huge amounts of data before you can do this properly. And then you probably also need data that's that's real time if you want to have anything that's predictive in the sense that I think people um, associate with the terms. Uh, so maybe one step back, what is predictive? Uh, in a certain sense, I think the original data science is an insurance, is actuarial sciences, 
uh, and is pricing the the whole idea about insurance pricing is you're trying to predict the typical risk of therefore that the typical chance that that an accident or something would occur to a certain profile and then price it appropriately so that is forward looking even though you're just using historical data for it you're not using uh, data captured uh, in the moment um the insurance industry, I think, fell behind and, and then software out of Silicon Valley came and they, they sort of took up the, the mantle for that. Uh, we're fortunate enough at knows that we've got some uh, investment and uh, one of our investors is the Fairfax um, Financial Holdings out of Canada. Uh, they own insurance assets worldwide and they're doing some really interesting things in what is truly predictive. Uh, the, the challenge with that, though, is that uh, if it's truly predictive... Um, you run the risk of crossing what they talk about in Silicon Valley as the creepy cool line, uh, where you might think that something is cool that technology can do it, but the moment that it happens with you, if you don't know that you've consented to this, it might just feel creepy. For instance, nobody's traveling at the moment, but let's say back in the days we were traveling or in future when we might travel again, you're on the way to the airport, you've logged in, so you've you've consented you know, for your information to be used, and then a service that you use pops up and saying, hey, Tian, I see that you're on this train and you're on the way to the airport um, and you usually book travel insurance through us. You haven't done it yet. Uh, can I help you to book travel insurance? Uh, now, that's really useful for me as a consumer. But if I don't know that I've consented, it feels super creepy. Why do, why do they know I'm on a train right now to the airport? What data pieces are they putting together and it feels like somebody might be in, invading my privacy. So I think when you're talking about real predictive analytics in the moment, um, you know, there's, there's much bigger questions to be asked than just, can I do it? Should I do it? And, and, and how do I know that my customers are okay with me doing it and that there's value in it for them? Um, so be careful when we're talking about the term, what we're actually talking about. Right, right. W would you suppose that, potentially a lot more companies are actually a lot further uh, in this than they would actually let us know? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Chelsea might know. No, one of the things that comes up so frequently, especially if you're hanging around in startup hubs, is people think that, that Facebook is spying on you. And I had a conversation about this today, and guess what ad popped up on Facebook? But then again, if you've been not thinking about red objects, and I so let's think about red objects. Suddenly all the red objects appear and it's not predictive analytics. It's just your brain suddenly being attuned to it. So uh, I'm not sure how much of it's just us expecting things to be following us and therefore we notice it or whether companies actually do it. Chelsea, what's your view? Um, I take more of the, like, yes, there are pockets of companies that may be super far along, but I take more of the stance of, change is hard and the problem at Hyperana that we're solving and just replacing little pockets of spreadsheets like even when it's a no-brainer of a use case for some of our customers it's taken like from proof of concept to like actually embedding it and scaling it up it's taken quite a long time we're still very early in the journey we're only five years old um, and we've kept most of our customers on that journey and we're lucky to to be to be working with these enterprise customers but the challenge is hard um, right can you think of any examples of perhaps clients or companies that you've interacted with in the past um, that are actually really sort of on that cutting edge of predictive analytics? Mm, they're going to have to remain nameless. <laughs> of course, yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> but again, even when I think of some of the big names, it's just pockets and very very specific use cases. Right. It's not something that's scaled out and then the capability is across all of the marketing teams and then across all of the customer bases. So again, I'm going to give you a non-answer on that. Right. Well, I don't know, <laughs> but it sounds like it's not even, wouldn't even always be the entire business. It's more like certain parts of the business, right? Certain pockets. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, and so what do you think are the biggest things actually holding companies back, you know, in achieving proper analytical capability? Oh, where do you start? I mean, like you could, 
pick any kind of categorization, you know, at Hyperana, we work on like the fourth or the last bit, that data consumption and the need for insights. But number one, you've got the data ingestion, the data quality, what what the fudge do we have here? How clean is it? What are we going to do with it? Are we going to do something with it? Um, then you've got the architecture type of discussion, what tools, what things, how, how do we make those kind of decisions so it all kind of swims together. Then you've got the governance and compliance conversations that you need to have and those challenges there. Then you've got the consumption and taking the business on that journey. So like that's where they, you know, they capture it as data transformation or digital transformations, but for organizations with 5, 10, 15, 30,000 individuals, w- employees working there. It's not an easy ask to go, let's just have a, let's call it a school of excellence in analytical capability and hire 10, 15, 20 good people to get there when it takes alignment across the whole organization to, to get their stuff together across all of those pockets. So that's why it's hard for even at Hyperano. If it's a no-brainer in that last pocket, the data congest- uh, data consumption and surfacing that across all of the organisation, if you don't have all of those ducks aligned, and it's not about doing it in a linear sense because each of those components will take a long time and you'll never see value and the business will always therefore be stuck on the status quo of just, okay, then we'll just go on gut feel and just make decisions how we always have. I think the pandemic, if there's been a silver lining for us within the industry or with data professionals, analytics, is now people are remote working. They're like, okay, so there's a need for insights. It's not just sitting in meetings and consuming PowerPoint packs and listening to the so-called experts. People, are, are, well, our clients are much more attuned to, okay, send me a pack, send me the insights. Let's, and then when we're going to have a Zoom meeting or a hangout conversation, let's just get straight to the so what and the what are we going to do about it. So right, you know, complicated journey. Right. And it sounds like, you know, the ownership of data, right? Who owns the data and is it you know the data or the uh, consumer the individual (laughs) you know so many uh, you know head of it technology the chief analytics officer chief customer officer um because there's so much ambiguity there it has to be top down and that transformation has to come top down right Um, right exactly so the uh, the sort of political constraints within a business can really sort of just halt innovation and and halt this whole process Right. Would you be able to sort of give any any tips about, you know, how one would go about, you know, breaking through all that? If you haven't already got started, just get started. There is no nirvana. Um, So maybe my advice is more of a wake up call. Like there is no perfect um, solution for it, but it's just get started. I ran about a month ago um, a. a virtual event, um, and the, the findings were recorded on our website, hyperana.com, um, with one of the heads of data and analytics at Equifax. And that company has a, a long history in the do's and don'ts of data, data governance, um, and predictive capability also. Um, and uh, Calvin gave 10 tips or things to avoid on building, I guess, data foundations for enterprise. So definitely i'm not going to give i'm not going to lecture you on that but that would be a useful resource to look at right right and um you know maybe when we turn to you uh tian you know what does the future look like for nose right in your eyes with regards to data analytics it's it's a good question i think um as a startup one of the challenges for you is where do you find data where for big organizations, it's I've got all this data, it's not clean and it's not organized, how do I get that to the next state? So they, they, they're slightly different problems. Uh, and I think we need to think differently so that we don't end up where those companies are today. So I think we've got to think about data now and investing, even if you don't see the, the, the clear value or business case, just the, there has to be belief somewhere, the belief that I've got to invest in capturing and, and keeping clean data, even if I can't use it all right now. Um, but I think as long as we're just focused on the pet industry as we are, uh, most likely it'll just be to do the same as what the others do, just do it better, maybe more cost effective and, 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 and faster. Um, yeah, because you, you, you can't necessarily go into some of those, those other streams. Um, the, the one thing that I, that I do think is, is the future for insurance obviously within you know what you've got to do from a from a compliance uh, and a governance perspective is 
uh, not just to have the right product at the right price, but to make sure that you're available and can be found by the customer uh, at the time when they have a need for the product. So it might not be as, as creepy as sending somebody a message when they're on the way to the airport. Uh, and certainly you don't want to take out pet insurance when you're already at the vet. Um, but I, I do think that there's a lot to be done. And this is where the future might be for us, a, a differentiated future is uh, understanding how you get to be visible to the customer when they're at the point when it's the right time for them to make a decision about, about pet insurance. Mm. Yeah, I think that's uh, quite a common, I suppose, you know, question um, when you talk to a lot of different companies, you know, including right broadcasting companies and uh, all the you know commercial aspects and things they're trying to achieve with that as well. Um, hey, maybe I guess suppose going to the I guess third and last part of the conversation, um, which um, well, hopefully we'll be, we'll be able to get some actionable insights, right? Some some wisdom, some tips that uh, yeah the the listeners could could take away. Um, so maybe you, Chelsea, what are like one, two, or three, um, yeah, things leaders could do today to uh, to really advance, uh, yeah, their their capabilities. Because I just gave you the soundbite of the conversation I had with Equifax recently. One of the, I think tip nine was make friends with legal and compliance. <laughs> That's typically not a tip that I would just come off the top of my head. Um, right. <laughs> but and don't make enemies um, with them. Um, what do you mean specifically? So yeah, well, that, that's just like tips in general in building analytical capabilities in terms of the cultural piece. Um, help well, me that, that's maybe a good example, right? I mean, um, the, the making friends with the legal team or compliance, it's those type of things that you, well, me, I guess, <laughs> I would think of maybe as one of the last things in line, right? After you already set everything up, but then if it, I suppose it's really one of those um you know, massive obstacles that might just cause you to put the whole thing on hold or, yeah, uh, really, you'll really end up ruining the whole thing. So, um, um, good example. Yeah, okay, so the, okay, that gives <laughs> in number one. I don't know if I have three. Um, number two would be, because this is a common concern or question that we get asked all the time, is uh, Hyperana speeds up the reporting piece. That sounds great maybe in a year's time once we've – embedded our data lake and our systems and then we can we can start looking at insights um whereas for us we're like you that sounds logical on the page but even in a year time like if you watch any um house building grand renovation shows everything always goes over budget and over time mm thinking grand designs yep. <laughs> so any data or transformation project will go over budget and over time so if you make plausibly that argument that you can't get insights today but maybe in six months or 12 months like you're kidding yourself um, what does that mean that means even more spreadsheets even more dashboards and again I came out of the PhD during the global financial crisis so trying to get an academic job was very very difficult I know some of my mentors were even involved in trying to find jobs even prior to that so I think coming into industry during that time it makes you feel very competitive or strategic about and grateful about okay how would I spend the money if it were my own money um, so thinking as a business intelligence or an analytics function going okay what are you going to do then if you're going to hold off on insights, continue with your current processes that are really propped up by a lot of people or no people and therefore a lack of intelligence. I think investing in, in a solution or tooling that helps you speed up that insights process is really important. Um, and I think it's important too if you're going to prepare your workforce for the future of work. Um, People are insecure or wondering, you know, how, what can I do to advance myself, particularly if we're working in a remote environment. We want professional development still. Um, we want to feel like um, the company can still invest in us. We can invest in ourselves. Um, but if I'm solving my problem of stats and numbers, I'm just not a number person. So hopefully Hyperana is that sweet spot of giving you insights really simple and, and, um, and also helping you understand them in a really simple way right and is hyperana ultimately um like would you have you seen hyperana i guess replace things like date you know people like data engineers or other parts of the analytics staff um 
Replace data engineers, no, because at the end of the day, the input of the data is we don't hire the data engineers. They're embedded within the organization. We don't touch their data. So that still needs to go on. And again, a typical data transformation quick could be five years. So you still need those individuals to to be owning that, to be doing that. And again, the context that comes out of the insight is heavily propped up by the individuals that know it, own it, deliver it. In the future, do we anticipate that there will be a shift? Absolutely. Um, And that was something that the very problem that Natalie starting the company wanted to solve because she was a data professional for over 10 years. She's thinking, how can I automate the stuff that I do for all of these clients and customers and reps so I can do more fun stuff? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Antion, how have you experienced, I suppose, right, the the current pandemic? you know, with regards to implementing your own data and analytics capabilities? I don't think the the pandemic's had much of an effect on that. Um, If anything, more people have gotten paid so we're busier than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think it's just the problem that businesses always have, that there are so many things to do, and it's quite easy to deprioritize data, especially if the payoff is into the future, just part of human nature, unfortunately. Uh, the same, actually, as, as you mentioned with, with, with compliance, right? For a lot of people, it's just that box I've got to go tick as the last step. Uh, where I think what we're trying to do is, with both compliance and with, with, with uh, insights and data, is try to bring that into the culture. And uh, both those should be cultural elements that we, we think all the time about acting responsibly and we think all the time about making decisions on concrete data, not on gut instinct. And if you keep those two things front of mind, whether you're in a pandemic or whether it's business as usual, uh, you do things just slightly differently, but the payoff, I think, of the long term will be will be significant. Right. Also, I mean, the both of you, I suppose, in your own ways are, you know, advocates of data and analytics and its capabilities and its value, you know, each from your own unique angles, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's very refreshing, you know, to, to hear from both both of you. Very interesting to, to talk about things that um, you know, I would think um, I wouldn't immediately connect with data and analytics and actually making it happen inside your business. For example, you know, legal compliance issues and so forth. Um, I suppose maybe to, to, to finalize things, right? Um, maybe, Tian, what, what actions are you taking now or are you going to take, let's say, Almost well now, <laughs> with regards to um, yeah, getting uh, getting the right insights and the right capabilities. So I, I think it's uh, for us it's baby steps. Um, we're not the organisation that has the the kind of data that you know you have data lakes for, and that you need to find tools to plug into. But the same attitude I think is still present. So one of the things we've done recently is uh, we we hired somebody that can sit across two fields and um, earlier I was speaking to, to Tim uh, about this that um, one of the reasons I got into accounting was you know when I was at uni was that 20 years ago uh, you studied accounting because that's where the information was and that's where business decisions came from was from accounting and I think that's shifted as more data has become available but I still think accounting data is extremely important financial data so uh, for us it's investing in people that uh, can sit across both those and uh, can help with a with a more routine kind of uh, accounting analysis and data, but then also have the uh, the mental capability to extend themselves into other things. And even if they don't necessarily know all the the coding language to go do fancy reports, it's ultimately about intellect and curiosity. And 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 um, you know once you've got that, you start uh, aggregating data. And you start cleaning it, you start using it. And as you do that, I think then you grow into different kind of uh, technologies and, and solutions. Um, I think the one of the, the most important things for us to, to keep in mind on a daily basis is the only thing with data that you lose the opportunity is you lose the opportunity to gather it, right? If you had interactions on the web and you didn't capture it, it's gone. You can always go clean your data later. You can always go and invest in the analytics later. But if you don't capture the data, uh, then you're not going to be able to go back to it later. At the same time, if you don't use what you've got today, 
then there's less of an appetite to capture more data because you don't see the, the value. So for me, those are the priorities right now is to use what we've got to build a culture around data and how important it is uh, and then to grow as, as the company and our data available to us grows. Great, great. And is there anything to add to that yourself? Oh, that totally like echoes with, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm contradicting myself because like I'm a huge advocate of data and my clients, customers um, are the ones, the enterprise customers with the data lakes and so forth. But if you think of me and my day job within the company at Hyperana, we're a growing startup. Um, most of the data that we need to make decisions just doesn't exist. <laughs> um, marketing team is me and someone else. We didn't exist a year ago within this capability. So if you ask me how I make decisions, it's actually asking what information are we not capturing mm -hmm. or this week we're capturing this information on new customers um, or leads. What signals do we need to look for going forward in the next week and the next month and then pivoting on that? Or if I have a problem that's more around the messaging of the problem, uh, the product, hyper -on -a messaging or a, a company that uh, how does how should this be positioned? Should it be AI? Should it be non-AI? Should it be automation? These are important questions that are going to have a huge impact on the company, but they can't be addressed by data or historical data. So, yeah, definitely echoes with me. <laughs> um, um, in terms of things that I'm focusing on moving forward, I want to keep it really simple. The proof is in the pudding. If Hyperana's mission is really about making insights accessible and simple, then I want more eyeballs, more people to see it, um, potentially on open data sets. So I was just tinkering around this week on some New South Wales government or federal government make, for instance, parliamentary spending um, quarterly. Um, accessible. So I was looking at what ex-parliamentarians Kevin Rudd was spending on during the pandemic versus not. Again, it's all PC. There's no clickbaity insights there. Um, but I, that's for me, particularly in a marketing role and a customer role, pushing that forward. Um, when we talk about this, Tian and I might bond over use cases because we get insurance. I've worked pockets here and there. But actually, at the end of the day, to the everyday Joe, it's pretty abstract. Like, the question is like still like what does it do? What do you solve for? Um, and that there's no aha moment. There's a lot of hype and there's a lot of oh data is hard. But if you actually see, for instance, you know what um, Scott Morrison was spending on this quarter versus next quarter has travel expenditure as you would expect decreased um, within the federal government? Has it? Yes, it has. I can see that within the data. But where has it increased? And when I saw it, it increased in private car travel. And then you could actually see to the detail of the parliamentarians that were catching um, private cars or taxis from Adelaide to Canberra. And I was thinking, man, that's a, that's a long drive. And you could see by name and whatnot. Again, it's not going to sell newspapers. But I think that's when people see. They're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is real data. And this is how it surfaced. And it happens to be something that I just, in a simple click, get that aha moment. Right, right. And it's the accuracy of the data that already already gives you immense value as, you know, you, you don't per se need, you know, the perfect predictive capability yeah, to, to really, you know, get, get value out of it at this stage. Yeah. Right. All right. Amazing. Well, thank you both so much for, for being here. Uh, this was a very exciting for me. Um, so, so Chelsea, if people are trying to find you or would like to get a hold of you, uh, you know, after this conversation, how would they get a hold of you? hyperana.com or find me Chelsea Wise on LinkedIn. Good, good. And uh, you, Tiana, in case uh, I suppose people have COVID puppies and want to get it insured still. <laughs> yeah, uh, the web is the best. It's nose.com.au and that's nose with a K, K N O S -E .com .au. Great, great, beautiful. All right, perfect. Well, thanks so much. And um, yeah, I look forward to continuing the conversation uh, in the future. Thanks for having us. Right. Thank you. Thanks for joining. This podcast was brought to you by Marshall McAdam, creating talent solutions in data, technology, transformation and finance across Australia. If you enjoyed the conversation, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe and share. If you'd like to get in touch with the Marshall McAdam team, simply send an email, visit the website or connect on LinkedIn. Contact details can be found in the description. See you next time.